Welcome to the show. On today's podcast, we have Dr. Renee Wellenstein. She's a double board certified doctor who has worked with women over 20 years. Due to her personal health challenges, she stepped outside the box of conventional medicine to heal herself from burnout. After falling off her horse and breaking her back, she struggled with severe back pain, fatigue, and inability to focus. After exhausting conventional medicine, she was referred to an anti-aging practitioner where she finally resolved her symptoms. This started her journey into the world of functional medicine. Now, Dr. Renee empowers women to take control of their health, jumpstart their energy, improve their confidence, and reignite their libido. In this episode, we'll be talking about women with hormonal imbalances, burnout, adrenal fatigue, and we'll be talking about low libido in women and how to overcome all of these issues. This is a great episode. Please enjoy. Hi, Dr. Renee. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about your journey from a traditional OBGYN to now helping women with functional medicine. Yes, it's a big, long story, but I'll try to condense it. And it's certainly not a journey I ever thought I would take. Essentially, I nine years ago, actually longer than that, gosh, 14, 13, 14 years ago, I was a busy OBGYN, but very happy doing what I was doing. And moved from the suburb of New York City up to the country in central New York with my then one old, one-year-old twins. And of course, what do I do when I get to the country? Being a daughter of a dairy farmer is I get a horse. <laughs> and uh, this is the horse that I wanted since I was seven. And here I was like 39. So I get the horse and, and shortly after having it, and it's interesting because it's all the timeline is a blur, but I fell off that horse and broke my back. And I always say that's where my journey begins because up until then, I was pretty much living what I thought was a storybook, beautiful life. And this is where my life came to a screeching halt, where I literally was going 150 miles an hour, taught like an infant mom of twins, working crazy hours. It's just all I knew up until that point. So I was literally halted on my couch for about six months and had the whole gamut, the, the walker, the shower chair, all the things. And this is when I first became a patient of traditional healthcare. And I always say I was like Humpty Dumpty that fell off the wall that couldn't be put back together again because my injury in my back, the broken bones actually could not be surgically repaired. They had to basically try to heal as best they could on their own. And I was also told I probably would have broken bones in my back for the rest of my life. So that was a hard pill to swallow because I'm of that mindset back then of just fix it now so I can get back to work. Like I have things to get done. And I couldn't. And so the other thing that was interesting is I am very goal oriented. So when a doctor tells me six weeks, you'll be back at work, you'll be feeling fine, you'll have no pain. And that six weeks comes and I'm not to that goal, the end point, I start feeling like what's wrong with me? I'm a failure. This is not how things are supposed to go. And six weeks went into six months. I finally had a procedure to get me back to work, to get me off of narcotics, which I do not do well with prescription pain meds, especially the strong things stuff. And not only that, one pill led to about 10 because I had to have a pill to counteract the nausea and the constipation, all the things. So I got back to work as an OBGYN. My scope of practice was limited. I could no longer deliver babies or operate because of this injury. So I was essentially... I, would, I don't want to say held captive, but I was in the clinic 24-7 doing pap smears. And it's interesting because that was all good for a little bit because at least I was back to work. But I'd come home at night to my husband and say, geez, I just am not changing lives anymore. This is not why I gave up my life to medicine and trained for so many years. So I, I took on little side things to do for fun. And throughout the next, I would say year and a half, I struggled with some other symptoms that I couldn't quite pinpoint the cause of, and that they included an inability to get out of bed in the morning. I essentially would have a good night's sleep or so I thought, but I I couldn't get out of bed. Despite my alarm, I just would want to sleep. I would get out of bed eventually, live on a pot of coffee a day, lots of sugar to just get through my day. I was really unmotivated to do anything, especially eat healthy. I would essentially open the fridge and I'd see salad mix in there. I was so exhausted. I would close up the fridge and go to the cabinet and get my potato chips or my cookies or whatever. And I'd eat the entire bag (laughs) of of what either. And uh, I essentially wanted to spend my days on the couch. And 
you know, when I'm looking at my life, I was like, gosh, this is just not normal. I feel like a deadbeat mom because here I'm not doing anything with my, then they were probably five, six, seven year old twins. I don't feel like a very good wife because I'm not really making meals. I'm pouring something from a package into a, a pot and just making it for the kids and my husband. And I'm really not finding purpose in my career anymore. And I'm like, gosh, is this how I'm going to have to live? So I got to the point one night where I said to my husband, and all along I'm having this back pain as well. And I remember saying to my husband in bed one night, I can't go on living like this. And, you know, just having thoughts and no longer living my life. I didn't have a plan, but that was my rock bottom. That's when I knew, gosh, I, I have to do something because this is not healthy. So of course I went to my doctor and I knew what she was going to say because I'm trained. I know what she's going to diagnose me with. And the only box that I could fit into was depression. So I knew she was going to say it, but she's, Hey, you had a life changing event. Your life does not look like it looked a couple years ago. And I think you have depression. And I said, yeah, I knew you were going to say that, but I just never pictured this is how depression should feel. And she's yeah, but what else do we have? And I was like, yeah, you're right. So just give me the pill and let me feel better. I took the pill and I did not feel better. As a matter of fact, I felt even worse because of the side effects. And what happened is three months later, I go back for my medication checkup and tell her I don't feel better. And of course, instead of thinking that maybe we have the wrong diagnosis, because her and I both at this point didn't know what else it could be. Of course, it must be a problem with the medication. So we try a different medication and I pretty much knew as soon as I started taking it and had all of the side effects again. Same with the first pill that something's wrong. This is not right. So I decided to go abruptly off my antidepressant and I do not recommend anyone doing that, but I did it because you have all these crazy withdrawal symptoms. But I did it because about a week or two prior to going off of it, I had been put into contact with what they call a functional medicine doctor. And at this point I had no idea what a functional medicine doctor was. I I didn't even Google it before getting on the phone with her one night. I just was so desperate. I'm like, okay. And honestly, at this point, I was selling skincare for something fun to do. And it was anti-aging skincare. And she was an anti-aging doctor. So I'm like, okay, I'm getting on the phone with this woman and just going to see if she wants to buy my skincare. And we get on the phone. And of course, she politely declines the skincare. But then she moves on to say, let's talk about your health. And I have to say, probably within the first two, three minutes of telling her all my symptoms. She said, I think you have adrenal fatigue is what we used to call it. And of course, now I'm sitting in my bed with my computer on my lap and I'm Googling adrenal fatigue. And this light bulb went off. Oh my gosh, this is exactly what I have. This is me to a T. And how do I not know about this? And how does my doctor not know about this? And she went on to say, of course, treatment is not not medication, prescription medication that is, is lots of lifestyle changes, a lot of TLC, probably some strategic supplementation, but you will feel better, not overnight, but you will feel better. And I have to say that one phone call that night was just the pivotal moment of my entire rest of my life because number one, she validated my symptoms. When I walked away with my doctor after failing the second antidepressant, I was pretty much told I'm going to have to live with my symptoms, which I couldn't even fathom that idea. I felt at that point so helpless and hopeless that I was never going to feel better. And I was feeling crazy. Gosh, am I making this all up? If we can't put me in a box and put a pill on it, gosh, it must be in my head. Until this woman validated that it was not in my head. It was something else that is outside the box thinking. And it was exactly how I was feeling. And right then and there, I was like, wow, like I, I, I finally got my hope back and she was willing to help me. Obviously, we had to make sure that was correct diagnosis with some testing, but she pretty much, she said, we can start a few things while we're waiting to get you in the office to confirm it. And then right on the back of that, she says, and how about joining me in practice? Would you like to set up a satellite office nearer to you as an offshoot of her practice? And I said, oh my gosh, like going into functional medicine. What? So then I Google again, functional medicine. Like at this point, I didn't even know what it was. And I read what it was about root cause medicine. And I said, this is my purpose. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And of course I said, yes. And this was January. And by September that month, it all came to fruition. But the funny part is my husband had gone into the shower when I got on the phone with this doctor and he came out, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes later. And I, I hung up the phone and I said, honey, I have, 
I don't have depression. I have adrenal fatigue. I'm going to do this and this. I'm going to go see this doctor in her office to make sure it's the correct diagnosis. Oh, and by the way, I'm leaving the hospital and my career is a traditional OBGYN and I'm going into functional medicine. I'm going to go do this fellowship through the University of South Florida. I'm going to do it mostly online while I'm still working, but then obviously there's some things I have to do in person. And then I'm going to drive an hour away to an office and set up a practice. And he's like, he said, how long was I in the shower for? (laughs) And really that is the first time I ever went with my intuition, went with my gut, like what felt right. Because as a doc, as a traditional doc, I was always just trained to use my head and follow the protocol, the algorithm, whatever you want to call it to make a diagnosis and put a pill on it. And this was really the first time I felt free to sign to go with what my body felt like, oh my gosh, this is the correct diagnosis. This is going to change my life. It's going to give me my life back. And this is now my purpose in life. This is how I'm going to help other women get healthy. And it was a no brainer for me because if I was trained in medicine and I didn't even know this whole world of functional medicine was out there, essentially waiting for me, I would have, I don't know what would have happened to my life, quite frankly. But to, to think that I would no longer be here is really makes me sad, especially since I have kids. But that was the the path I was going on. And uh, I never wanted a woman to feel how I felt again. So that's how I got into functional medicine. It, exactly. I started my fellowship right away while working as an OBGYN. I left my hospital in July of that year. And by September, I was sitting in a new office practicing functional medicine. I love that because I love functional medicine. I'm right there with you. I had all these symptoms. I go to the doctor. They give me a pill. The pill maybe work temporarily or none at all. And then they would just say, it's in your head. You're just depressed. You're just whatever, stressed out or whatever. There's nothing we can do for you. And it would be, if you go down the line with functional medicine, it'll be like either your hormones are out of balance or for example, I had reflux and they're like, okay, you need to take this pill. I looked up the side effects. I'm like, no, I am not taking this pill. So then I'm like, okay, what can I do? My husband does functional medicine. He's you're going to take this supplement and it's going to help coat and calm down the inflammation and you're going to stop eating at this time. And then boom, it went away. And then I see people who take these things and they get worse and worse because they're doing the lifestyle and they're putting a bandaid on it. Mm -hmm. So then it progresses and they're like, my doctor said I can just do this. So that's what I'm going with. Yeah. In the defense of the docs out there, because I'm married to one who saves lives every day in the hospital. So he practices a little different medicine because when you see him, you, he's going to either cure your infection or save your life and get you out of the hospital. And it's really interesting when we go to events locally, they say, how are you living together now that she does this and you do what you do? And he says, when you come in the hospital, essentially I have to save your life. But when you get out, that's when you could be more proactive and work with her and not come back into the hospital again. So I really love how he says that prior to even me doing this, he wouldn't even know what this is. So a lot of docs out there don't even know, and I didn't know. So they don't know an alternative to what they have been trained to do, which is make a diagnosis and prescribe. And I can say that because that was me until my eyes were opened up. And, And honestly, you can't have your eyes open unless you want them to be opened. And the other thing is docs are so busy, right? Especially now that they literally have five minutes to see you. And we're trained to, we are trained to put the band-aid on it, but that our society is one to, I was that person initially in my, in my journey is give me that pill. Just get me back to work. Give me that pill to make me feel better. Just put the band-aid on it. I really wasn't wanting to do, and I didn't know I could do that lifestyle work. It wasn't even on my radar, but I wasn't in the place to do it right in the beginning of my journey. I was still in that, got to get back to 150 miles an hour. Got to get back to a crazy life. And I do think for functional medicine, it takes one having a practitioner who's knowledgeable. And there's a lot of information online. You are correct. You can go out there and search it. Just make sure you have a credible source. But number two, you have to be in a place in your life that you're willing to do the changes because it is not a quick fix overnight magic pill kind of practice. It is definitely doing the deeper work, mind, body, spirit, all of it to get on your journey, whatever it is that you want to heal from, but everything from burnout, libido are the two things I always talk about, but like reflux and all of the things like, for instance, reflux, you have some supplements, lifestyle changes, including changing your nutrition, probably your stress level, all the things. And for someone who's not ready to embark on that lifestyle change, it can feel hard until they get to that point where, okay, I'm done. The medication's either no longer working and I'm tired of taking the medication and I'm ready to make the change. So 
Yeah, not to say that medicine isn't great when you're in an emergency situation. Definitely for emergencies, but if it's a lifestyle cause, you need lifestyle to fix it. Correct. Yeah. And if you need it, you have an infection, you need your antibiotic. And if you're like my husband's scenario with saving people in the hospital, you need his interventions. But there's not to say that in so many people that I've come across and talked to and worked with are those people that have had that situation where they've gotten really sick and they just don't want to go back down that path again. Unfortunately, that that's what it takes a lot of people. Look at me. It took me rock bottom to come back out of where I was, but it, and it didn't happen overnight. It took me a bit to come to this moment in my life. I'm like, I have to do something. And obviously I'm not going to be saved by conventional medicine. I see it all the time. My doctors want to listen to me or they don't want to help me. And it's not that they don't want to help you. I think, and this was, again, this was even myself trying to take care of myself. I didn't even know what else to think that I didn't have another diagnosis to grasp onto. I didn't have another pill to think of giving myself or else I may have, (laughs) but I ran out of options. And that's where it comes to for a lot of people where I love when people are a little more proactive and say, I don't even want to go on the medication. I want to do the lifestyle changes. Kudos to you. But the majority of people out there, we are in the society of go fix me yesterday. (laughs) Give me that pill. And until we switch that mentality of, okay, I want lifelong health. I never want to be on that pill again. And some people even like, for instance, depression, I have a lot of people that come to me on antidepressants. They don't want to be on them anymore. I certainly don't take them off of the antidepressants, but I am hopeful that we get them to the point where they can actually talk to their doctor about coming off of them because they're in a good place to do. And that's just one circumstance of, yes, they need it now, but in the future, if they really have the will and want to get off of it, chances are we could probably do that. Let's talk about hormones because that's super fun. In your bio, you had mentioned that you fell off a horse. And I've heard that this may be left field, but I've heard that head trauma in particular can cause hormonal imbalances. Do you see any of that? And do you feel that there might be a connection? I don't take care of a lot of people with head trauma. And me in particular, that was one thing that didn't get hurt was my head or so I thought because I was wearing a helmet and I didn't hit it. We have to think about the whole, it all starts in the head, right? Our two main centers of hormone balance come from what they call the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And then they they send signals down to the ovaries, to the adrenals, to the testes, to the thyroid. I can't say I haven't done the studies because again, this is not really my area of expertise as far as taking care of people, but intellectually thinking, yeah, I would see I would definitely think that a head trauma could cause a hormone balance because it all starts in the head. And if we disrupt the signals coming from the head, going downstream, we absolutely could cause an imbalance. So we talk a lot about hormonal imbalances in women. Other than maybe genetics, are there any things maybe within our control having to do with lifestyle that can cause hormonal imbalances? Oh my gosh. How much time do we have? (laughs) There is a lot. Let's see. Let's start with what I had, which was stress. The stress hormone cortisol actually can cause a hormone imbalance, particularly of the female and male hormones, because when you look at how hormones are made, particularly the adrenal hormones, so those of our flight or fight response or stress response, as well as the reproductive hormones, so the male and the female hormones, they all are on this continuum, the same little pathway. And not to get too scientific or technical, but it all starts with cholesterol and then it flows downstream. And what happens is if you your body is in this constant fighting the tiger mode. So essentially, and this is how we live right now, right? Like we wake up stressed, we go to bed stressed, and we're stressed all day. Our bodies were not made for that. Our bodies were made to have that acute stress. So the tiger jumping out of the bush, we kill the tiger, the tiger kills us, whatever way it ends. And our stress level comes back down. Nowadays, and I'm not saying acute stress like that is bad. That's actually a good stressor to have. You're getting up and doing a talk in front of a, a crowd of 100 people, or you have to take a test, or those are good stressors. That is good for our body. What's not good is this unrelenting, nonstop, 24-7 stress, which I was having before my injury. Like I wasn't sleeping. I had newborn twins. Like I was living in the suburb of New York City. Gosh, that in of itself was stressful in retrospect, not when I was living in it. But I, and it was that fall off the horse that really threw me for a loop with my cortisol. And essentially up until then, I was just pumping out that cortisol to fight the next tiger. And at the expense of stealing all of what they call the precursors, so all of the stuff to use to make the female and the male hormones, I was using to make my cortisol. So that's number one. Definitely, we can 
our nutrition definitely has an impact on a lot of different things. Our gut health, there is this component of our, what they call microbiome. So the bacteria in our gut called the estrobilome that actually breaks down estrogens. And this is the field of gut health is so it's, I don't know how many studies are coming out per day. Just, it's just exploding. And what we're learning about these different bacteria in all parts of our body is really fascinating. But I found as an OBGYN, the most fascinating is, are these bacteria that actually help break down estrogens and you can essentially disrupt the nice, delicate balance of these bacteria in your gut by eating highly processed diets, low fiber diets, which kind of go hand in hand with highly processed food, which means refined carbs, for instance, they have all of their good fiber taken out. And that's really what these bacteria need. So we find, I think it's 97% of Americans are uh, deficient in fiber in their diets. It's some really high number. And I have to think if we're not feeding our gut bacteria, the fiber, that's their food for fuel. That's what they use to grow, to thrive and to other, to make other chemicals that will help benefit the health of the gut, that help it keep the inflammation at bay. So essentially our nutrition can do that to our actual gut bacteria. It also can throw off our insulin levels and cause, you know, insulin, what they call insulin resistance, which is really hard to deal with because here you are, like you can't deal with even normal levels of blood sugar in your body after a while. So that makes it, and for women that usually translates to weight gain, which is one of the biggest things I hear women complain about and come to me for, let's see, gosh, there's a lot. There's toxins, which are hidden in so many things. Something is what they think you think is benign is plastics can actually disrupt your hormones. So those plastic storage containers that everybody has to store food, I know they may say BPA free, but the Alternatives to BPA have not been proven to be any safer. And essentially what happens is say you make a nice meal and you put it into this plastic container warm, that warm, that heat is actually going to leach the chemicals out of the plastic into your food and then you're going to eat it. So that's a huge, and I know they're cheap. You can get them at the grocery store. They're easy, right? But (laughs) they're not healthy. And the plastic water bottles, drinking, leave it in your car in the summer and then bringing it back in and putting it in the fridge well, you've already leached a lot of chemicals out of the water bottle. Starbucks, those little plastic lids on top, you're drinking through that lid, leaching the chemicals from the lid. So there's that, which I feel like is such, it's, it's an easy thing to do. It might not be most cost effective to do it all at once, especially if you have a lot of storage containers. But I think little by little, just being mindful of trying your best to maybe have a stainless steel water bottle to, to refill, which is best better for the environment anyhow, and transitioning at home to safer storage containers would definitely be a start. The other thing is personal care products, which is a huge uh, can of worms to open. But I think the biggest tip I can give the audience is if you have anything that has a fragrance in it, it says fragrance, perfume, proprietary fragrance, whatever. It's a code word for a chemical that's disrupting your hormones. It's uh, phthalates, which are not good for keeping our hormones in balance. So essentially they get unfragranced, either even fragrance with essential oils is, is much better, obviously, than the these and again, it's three thousand code words for this perfume or whatever. But translation, you see that word, run for the high hills, put it down, don't get it, because it means it's gonna just contribute to your hormone imbalance. And you have to think of it, women are putting on their bodies, gosh, like three to 500 chemicals today, a day. And I, I know you're probably listening and saying, I don't put 300 different things on my body, but let's look at the bottles of the things that you're putting on from your shampoo to your body wash, to your lotion, to your hair gel, to the 50 things we put in our hair, how much makeup we put on, right? Each of those has probably 15 to 30 ingredients in it. Multiply that by the number of products you put on your body every day. We can easily get up to that 300, 500 mark of potentially harmful endocrine disrupting chemicals that you're putting on your body every single day. So I, I don't really love going down the toxin rabbit hole, but my point is if you have your favorite fragrance, whatever, like one thing, fine, but it's just that cumulative toxic toxin load that we're putting on our body every day that starts to compromise our ability to detox, our ability for our bodies to get rid of it and to keep our hormones in balance. I could probably go on and on, but <laughs> I think that's a couple good ones. 
Yeah, I remember when I realized the PPA thing in the containers, I went on this hunt to find one. I finally found one from Pyrex that it's glass and glass on the top and it's only sealed with silicon Mm -hmm. around the edges, which I don't even know if silicon is that safe. Nobody really says I can't find anything on that, but it's just the edges. So I'm like better than Mm -hmm. the rest. They're so expensive and they're so hard to find. And that's the only one that I have find. The rest have plastic tops. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And you know, so here's my, so for your audience that says, okay, I can't afford to do a full overhaul of of all of it at once. And I get it. So here's the tip with the plastics. Make sure your food is cooled before putting it in and don't heat in it. Again, at the end of the day, let's just think about like how we're going to decrease the exposure. Not yes, it's best to do the glass, but I'm, I know it's, it's hard to do. And now you're telling me I have to throw out all my makeup. No, (laughs) like little by little, just look for safer alternatives, try to use up what you have and then buy the safer, healthier alternatives as far as the perfume products that is. Yeah. For a lot of things, I like to use mason jars because they're Mm -hmm. basically free from Mm -hmm. your leftover sauces or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's a good one. And there is one makeup company that I found 100% pure where they don't have any endocrine disruptors or any of those things. It's not going to be the same quality (laughs) as the ones that do. So you Mm -hmm. have to lower your expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a site called Credo Beauty and they have a lot of and I think even Sephora is trying to jump on the bandwagon. They still there's still mm. a little what they call greenwashing going on yeah. there. There's still a little they're saying natural this and that and it's you got to be careful. But and I, I always love when people are like, "Hey, I wear no makeup." I'm like, "Good for you cuz you don't even have this problem then." But all the way down to our skincare products, let alone there's makeup, skincare, all of it. It's just a matter of starting to just be a more educated consumer to start asking questions, looking at the ingredients. Don't always be fooled by the natural this and that. Stay away from the red number, whatever, blue number. That like that makes me just run because I'm like, that just is a pure chemical going into our body that why does something have to be blue if it's called raspberry, right? Like, why can't it just be the regular color? Like we just are so conditioned as a society that if I'm drinking raspberry it has to be blue. And if I'm drinking, I don't know what's red, but I don't know what's uh, strawberry has to be red or pink. And I'm like, that's just chemicals in there that are making it that color. So uh, I do think these few things that you can do just to start intervening on decreasing the toxins and we don't have to get into home purifiers and water filtration. We can go down reverse osmosis, all of that. But I think it's safe to just start with a few things that you can do like the plastics, like just being a better consumer with your personal care products. Um, making sure you eat your fiber as much as you can. So that translates usually to veggies. Non-starchy veggies are a really great source. It's my favorite source of fiber, as well as chia seeds. And I love avocados for the healthy fat and just really being kind to our gut bacteria so they can help us. And, and you know, trying to keep our stress at bay as best we can. I know that's hard. And this is something I talk about so much because it was a problem before this global pandemic, and it's even more of a problem right now. And a, a lot of women come and they say, my doctor just says, decrease your stress, but they don't tell me how. I get it. They don't have time to tell you how, you know, and everybody's different. I do think the easiest thing with that is awareness around what is causing you stress. What steps can you take to try to, I always call it the ABCs, awareness around your stress. What boundaries can you set? A lot of us ladies are saying yes to everyone and no to ourselves, and we're putting 10 things on our list a day when we honestly can only get three things done. Then we're falling in a bed at night feeling like a failure because two things. Number one, we had no time for ourselves. And number two, we didn't get our whole to-do list done. So I always say put three things on your list, like at the top, what you have to get done. I always talk about my D's, what you can delegate to someone else to do, what you can, you have to do yourself. What can you delay? Maybe it doesn't have to be done now. And what can you just completely take off your list? And then the C part is communication. Again, as women, I think we're we've been raised, and I was just writing a social media post about this. Like we've been raised to, and maybe it's our mothers, like that we're super women that we have to do it all. And our roles, where a lot of us are wise mothers, but our roles beyond just the household duties, and I hate to say that because it's very stereotypical, but at the end of the day, a lot of the duties do fall on the woman in the house. We've expanded. Our roles are now including maybe work outside the home, maybe our own businesses, maybe more than one business. And we're trying to keep it all juggled at the expense 
of our own health. And we're trying to still do all those other things that we used to do and all the things that now in our new roles we have to do. And we're not asking for help. And again, at the end of the day, it's leading to resentment and anger and frustration in relationships. It's leading to burnout in the women because they just they have no more energy to get anything done. It has led to a, a loss of self-care. A lot of women don't even know what they enjoy anymore. And when I say self-care, I'm not talking about manis and petties. I'm talking about going for a walk, reading a book, taking a bath, <laughs> sitting down and breathing for five minutes. Like so many women I talk to them, I'm like, what do you like to do? They're like, I don't know anymore. Like I just have no time for myself. And so I think as far as stress management, it's just that awareness around what it is that's stressing you out, the four Ds, who else can help you out? Where can you set your boundaries? And where can you ask for help? Again, kids. I have teenage kids. They certainly help me around the house. Your friends, where can your friends help you out? Pick up the kids from school maybe one day to give you an extra half hour to maybe do something for yourself. And just coming back to yourself and giving yourself in the beginning at least 15 minutes a day to do something that you love. And if you don't know what that is, 15 minutes to sit there and try to reconnect with who you are and what you love. And that will help. Your stress will help your hormone balance. So closing yeah. out the hormone imbalance. <laughs> What are your thoughts on the diet? Because I know you mentioned add, add fiber and vegetables, but I hear from different experts, vegan only, no keto only. And then I'm just very confused. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I've gone through all of it. I was, I'm mostly, I try to be mostly plant-based, but I don't like putting myself into a box. That's for sure. I've tried the boxes. And at the end of the day, I feel like I was against keto for the longest time because of female hormones and thyroid. And you know, I do think women need more than 20 grams of carbs a day for long term, that is. And so I've kind of adopted if someone wants to do keto, then I would say four to six weeks, low, like 20, 25 grams of carbs. And they were talking net carbs, because I think at the dawn of the keto world, they, they didn't count fiber. When we talk net carbs, we're, we're looking essentially at how, if you look at a label, that says fiber, like how much of that is sugar and how much is fiber? Because they're much different in how the body uses them. And in the historic keto days, I was like, oh gosh, you're going to tell me that these people are taking out all their veggies because they are higher in far fiber, which essentially does look like a carb, but not really. And I feel like this has pivoted and transitioned because a lot of the diehard keto people realized that it was disrupting women's hormones to count just carbs all the same. So that this term of net carbs of like essentially seeing, okay, the net carbs, how much sugar is in it? Uh, how many carbs minus how many fiber equals your, your net carbs. So that's really how many carbs are in something has 10 grams of carbs, but it's all 10 grams of fiber. That's zero net carbs. That's a good food to have. That's not going to spike your, your blood sugar and your insulin. I do think if I think you got to go with what feels good to you. I do love plant-based. I think there's a lot of benefits to eating plants. However, I don't think, and I've done research on the vegan diets. I have lots of books around my office here on the vegan world. And I do think a lot of times you can find research that will support whatever you're stating your claim, putting your, your stake in the ground saying, this is what I'm doing. You can see the keto studies, you can see the vegan studies, you can see them all. But I think a a balanced diet, a whole food diet, 80% of the time. So I think that I'm pretty clear on, on trying to kick the crap to the curb. And that is your packaged food. And it's so interesting. When I started talking about whole foods and packaged foods, I remember one of the very first challenges I did a few years ago, the women are like, okay, my green beans come in a package. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm like, if you have packaged green beans, they're fine. What we're talking about are those mixed vegetables with some probably artificial chicken frozen with a packet of sauce in the section of the freezer in this grocery store that's going to price it there for two years and still be good in two years. Those are the foods that we're talking about. We're not talking about coffee. We're not talking about your green beans or your asparagus. So I think starting to try to wean down as much as possible off of those more convenient foods because it doesn't have to be hard to eat a whole food diet. Cook up a piece of chicken and a couple sides of veggies a starch if you like it. My starches are usually like a sweet potato or really, but to say that I don't ever have white rice, no, I'm not gonna, but I don't have it that often. I'll have cauliflower rice because I'm really just like, every time I eat, I look at my plate and go like, how much is feeding my gut bacteria good things like the fiber? I'm crazy like that though. So I do think primarily focusing on a whole food diet at the end of the day is important. Carbs, everything in moderation. Like I, I 
for women in hormone balance, sometimes I do recommend a little bit of the higher, healthier fats because I think we harmed a lot of our hormones by going completely non-fat. And we know what that that did for us because all the non-fat products have high sugar, artificial sweeteners, all the stuff that's not only harmful to our gut, but also wrecks havoc on our hunger hormones, makes us even more hungry and addicted to these foods. So I do think there's a satiety component in having foods that are higher in fat. And I'm not talking about bacon. I'm talking about adding maybe some avocado oil, olive oil, making your own salad dressing, having an avocado, ghee or butter here and there, nuts and seeds I love. And I do think, I love the Mediterranean diet, by the way. I think that is probably of of all the diets, the healthiest, because it focuses mostly on fish, not a lot of red meat. I, I personally don't have any red meat anymore for the last couple of months, maybe chicken here or there, but I definitely have fish, some seafood, veggies. You're going to get so hit, sick of me here at saying veggies, but I do think getting out of our head to say that we need that baked potato at dinner. Like I think a couple of veggies will fill you up just fine. And it'll make you feel a lot better waking up the next morning that you actually went to bed, not fighting all that carb load because we are a bit more insulin resistant in the evening hours. So when I do have my female clients that I work with, I say, try to put your carbs earlier in the day when you're active and you're more insulin sensitive than in the evening hours, especially since again, most of the women I work with are trying to lose weight. And, but to say that if you have it at night, like you're awful and you're guilty. No, let's stop shaming ourselves about what we're eating. Let's just try to be more mindful of what we're eating. Balance is key to start with. I think at the end of the day, let's make sure you get your healthy fats, you get your protein, whether you want it from an animal source or a, a plant source. And if you want your carbs, just try to try to do the healthier ones as much as possible. Your quinoa, your sweet potato, your, your even your starchy veggies versus the non-starchy are always the way to go. Just think of like how best to take care of your gut and your hormones and your weight at the end of the day. Because again, a lot of women worry about their weight. And I think it's just being a little more in tune with what is on your plate and in, you're putting in your body is a really great place to start. I've heard both sides on women in fasting. So if you have mm-hmm. adrenal fatigue, a lot of people say you can't fast because your adrenals are all messed up. Or if you have low hormones, you shouldn't mm-hmm. fast because you need to build hormones. I don't know. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a lot of friends that are intermittent fasting experts. And I do love a 12 hour fast just to give your gut a break at a minimum. I do think women who are have burnout adrenal issues, we have to start healing their body first before we get any strict. As a matter of fact, those are the women that I say, I want you to have some more carbs. I want you to, obviously, we skew it to the healthier carbs that I just spoke about, but let's not be doing keto. Let's not be doing this 16 hour fast because your body has been stressed enough. Let's get your body out of that freak out mode because fasting is a stressor to your body. It's a healthy stressor, but we've got to actually put it in a body that's ready to be able to use that stress to its advantage. And for women generally, even I love, and again, I'm not an inter- inter- intermittent fasting expert, But I generally say like a 12 hour fast is usually not hard, especially if you stop eating in the evening hours after dinner and then wake wake up and eat shortly after getting up. You could probably, if you stop by eight and get up seven, do your thing, take a shower. By the time you get downstairs, it's eight o'clock. You can eat again. That just allows your gut to rest and digest. But there is this little complex in your gut that is like a, I call it a street cleaner. So this little, they're actually this like this motility complex, but it's, I think it's easier to think of it as a little street cleaner and the little street cleaner can't come out unless the food has completely digested. So think about it. If we're constantly eating, so say you eat your dinner and then at midnight you have your midnight snack and then you eat again at six, it takes six hours for your gut to completely empty out. And th- what this little street cleaner does, it actually gets all those undigested food particles out. It like sweeps the bacteria through. So like it like, Cleans your colon. You don't even have to do anything. And it's that gurgling sound you hear when you're hungry. I don't know if you ever hear that. But now that I hear that and I know what it is, I'm like, oh, my street cleaners are out. Like they're cleaning the, the, the gutters out to make sure all those undigested food particles have come through. And that that's one way of making sure that we don't get an overgrowth of bacteria in our gut. But it just allows your hormones to come back into balance, your insulin level to come down, your gut to rest a little bit before it has to get to work again and start digesting. So I Definitely think 12 hours is doable for most people. Again, for those with adrenal issues and burnout, I really, I don't focus first on like 
the macronutrients and the fast that we focus on healing your body, eating real food to fuel your body, getting off the sugar as much as possible, getting off the caffeine, the things that are fueling the adrenal fire before we go, okay, let's, you know, go on the non-starchy carbs. And we don't do any of that fancy stuff with them. Like I think nutrition, including fasting has to be personalized to what is going on with the person. And there are a lot of people out there that thrive with intuitive eating, eating what feels good to them. I do think we have to get some of that emotional connection to food under control before we can go intuitively to just see what our body wants. Like a lot of us, I can see even myself, we can get out of tune with what our body really wants. And we can go with what our mind thinks we want because of the stress level or because we're bored. Oh, we want the, the, and again, I love chocolate. I love dark chocolate. So I always use chocolate as an example or cookies, but that's going to give us this surge of this chemical called dopamine in certain situations that feels good, but are we really hungry for that? Or are we just are emotionally eating it because of the boredom other stress? And that's going off on a little, another topic of more mindful eating and just being present in your body and your emotions. But I think we got to meet a woman and I say woman, cause that's who I treat. I have to meet her where she's at. And eventually maybe we'll be able to get to that point of wherever she wants to go, whether it be a lower carb nutrition plan or a vegan. But right now we just have to get her healed wherever that is for her. And then that will be the next step. And do you use any adaptogens for burnout and stress and supplements? Mm -hmm. Yes. I love supplements, but I strategically use them because you can you can definitely use them like prescription medications, right? Oh, I have this symptom. I'm going to take this supplement. I have this, especially when it's burnout, a woman with burnout and I'm talking to her about lifestyle changes. She's tired. Like I get it. Cause that was me. Like I, I said, I'd open the fridge. I'd be like, heck no, I'm not eating that salad. I'm gonna go eat the chips. So how do I get her to want to take the next steps to eat a little bit better, to get a little more energy? And one thing is a B vitamin, B complex. I love B complexes. They are number one, they're used up with stress, all of the B vitamins. So the B complex has a little of all the B vitamins, not a lot of any of them. But essentially, why do I recommend it? Most of women, most women are deficient because of the stress, but because of our nutrition. Even if someone is eating a whole food diet, a lot of our soil is not being repleted with the nutrients that we need in our food. And that the, there's that. And then there's also, I live in New York and my food, if it's coming from California on a truck, it's my broccoli's lost all its vitamin C by the time it got to me. I do love the B vitamins because of the nutrient deficiency in a lot of foods and the st stress that's depleting it, but it's also a great source of energy. So I strategically use this, yes, to give the woman back what her body's lacking, but number two, to give her a little extra energy in her B vitamins. Cause you know, it's funny when I started functional medicine, I have all these people coming in with their B12 shots. And it was like, I was taking their life away. If I was taking their B12 shots away from them, I'm like, no, you can take it by mouth. If your gut is working, you can take a B like a sublingual or a liquid. You don't need the shots, but they equated the B12 with energy. The same with all of the B vitamins, essentially. They're all very energizing. I'm very careful though, with people with burnout, like we start, my motto is always start low, go slow. Because a lot of people with that burnout. They, they have very low energy as it is. They don't, it takes energy to utilize a lot of supplements. So I, again, B vitamin of the dose, lower end of the dose. So if it says two capsules, a lot of times I'd start my, my patients on one. Another thing I love for burnout is vitamin C is really good. It's a great nutrient for the adrenal glands. The highest amount of vitamin C is actually in the adrenals and it's actually used up with stress. So that's another one I love. As far as adaptogens, my favorite is ashwagandha. I do find and it's really interesting where they use, they're use they using adaptogens now because of the fact and an adrenal gland adaptogen essentially will adapt your cortisol. to It's like your body's own little adapter. So if your cortisol is high, it will lower it. If it's low, it'll raise it. But I do love that a lot of people are using it. Just I see it in pre-workouts to help with, with focus. That paired with my fourth, no, my third favorite, which is L-theanine, which is an amino acid from green tea that really helps calm you and induces what they call alpha waves in the brain that just within 30 minutes of taking it, especially a capsule, you just feel the sense of calm without feeling sedated. I always call it the natural Xanax because you just, when you have to do something that requires focus, but maybe you're so stressed because you have a deadline, it will just bring that, that stress down so you can focus to get the task done. And again, I see that in a lot of workout drinks too, because it helps with that focus and it works really well with caffeine as well. But so my favorite would be a B-complex, L-theanine, and ashwagandha. 
Yeah, my I husband gives me the L-theanine and I and he gave it to me and I calmed down so much. I'm like, you drugged me. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's something I used to use in a more, there's chewables, but a lot of them have artificial, well, not artificial stuff, but like a sweetener in them, but, or even a liquid by my nightstand. Cause I used to wake up at two o'clock in the morning when I was recovering from my burnout, I'd wake up with my thoughts racing and I would just, in the capsule again, it takes 30 minutes. And it, I was back in that time of like, Got to, got to get back to sleep, got to get to work, got to do all the things. So I'd have it at my bedside. So I would just take it and that chewable, the sub, like the liquid would actually work faster and I would go right back to sleep. And it's really great for in the moment stressors too. For instance, I used to have to give in-person talks to like hundred people in my office. And while I'm fine speaking, it's just, there's something with a hundred people looking at you. Oh, I'm like a little nervous. So I would actually do my power pose, take my l and go and kill it and be just fine and focus. And oh gosh, that's such a weird feeling of like just previously feeling nervous and anxious. And now all of a sudden it just is this calm comes over you. That's no other. So it's a great secret supplement of mine. So before we go, I need to talk about libido. So you call yourself the libidoologist. So tell me a little bit about what causes low libido in women. Okay. Uh, That's another big can of worms. And what's interesting is, let me just tell you my evolution of getting to libido because I call myself the libidoologist because I essentially study libido. Back in the day of OBGYN, again, I was just that that doctor that, of course, looked at all the studies, prescribed the medication that was supported by the studies, and that was it. And if I didn't have a study or a pill to fix something, I didn't want to talk about it. And that was libido. Back in the day, I had one hormone replacement that had testosterone in it. I gave it to a handful of women that had to be menopausal because they're the only ones that needed the hormone replacement. And in retrospect, I killed their livers because oral estrogen and testosterone will do that. But not only that, they'd come back and be like, it's no different. So this is really, and I've been in women's health for over 20 years. That was really the first time that I started two things. Number one, I never wanted to talk about libido because I didn't know how to fix it. And as a doc, I'm supposed to fix it for you. But number two, I started questioning like, wow, I always thought it was testosterone but maybe not. Ladies, we're not men. (laughs) It's not always testosterone because we are so much more complex. So what happened is when I left OBGYN and went into functional medicine, I still played a lot with hormones. And whether it be testosterone cream, I didn't have a lot of women on that because unless I was using it for muscle preservation or like metabolism, there's other reasons to use testosterone. But I was playing with the female hormones even, and I was like, that's not doing it. So what is it? Because we're so conditioned to think it's just hormones. And working with women on other things like her mindset, like talking about her communication and relationships, talking about stress, talking about her nutrition, a lot of these things too, like we said earlier, can trickle down to cause a hormone imbalance. Like inadvertently, I'm still treating their hormones, but I'm not giving them the prescription. So when I continued to work, I found that there's a lot of other things. Yes, it might be a hormone imbalance, but it's coming from upstream reasons like those self-sabotaging things that we're doing to ourselves every day, mindset-wise, food-wise, not moving our bodies that are contributing to gut dysfunction, hormone imbalance. When I work with women now, and I transitioned about a year ago just to speak on libido because the online health space got so loud with the pandemic and everyone was being helped with their gut health and their immune system, which I can riff on as well. But no one was talking about something in women that number one was getting worse during the pandemic. And number two, we just weren't talking about it because it's such a taboo topic, and that was libido. So in working with women with their libido, I can still work on gut health and immune system and all of the, and and definitely burnout because that's usually one of the the reasons. But to say a woman can be fixed with a pill is just, it's false. It's a myth, uh, especially when it comes to libido. We are, we got to give ourselves a lot more credit that we're more complex than that. Um, And again, I worked with men for four years and they're a much easier quote unquote fix when it comes to libido. It is testosterone. hundred percent of the men that would come in, the reason they had all these other symptoms for years, like months before, like they were crying, they had no energy, they were losing muscle tone, all signs of low testosterone. But when it hit the bedroom, they were through my door faster than anything. And I say, you had all these other symptoms. Like, why are you in here now? I I don't want to have sex. That's the problem. (laughs) And I was like, Oh, okay. We we can fix that. Like I see your levels low, just give me some testosterone and you're all better. And it it was like night and day for men. I didn't see that with women. And the other thing that really got me questioning the whole testosterone role is I have women generally between 20 and 60s, probably 50s. It's the biggest age group of women I work with. 
what was the interesting observation, I've done a lot of talking to women and observing over my 20 years, is that I would have menopausal women that were like coming in saying, my libido is amazing. Think about it. They're not supposed to, like, quote, quote, not supposed to because their just, their hormone levels are so low. But meanwhile, they had a better libido than they did when they were 20. And I'm like, that's something's weird here. And then I have my 20 year olds whose hormones are supposed to be beautiful that are telling me they have no desire. And I'm like, it's got, for some women, it has to be more than just their own natural, like female hormones or testosterone. There's something bigger than that going on here. And so I think a lot of people don't talk about it because it is hard. It's not easy. It's complex. Every woman's different. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things that contribute and could lead to the hormonal imbalance. But I do think if we work upstream on a lot of the things that flow downstream to lead to balanced hormones, we are in a much better place that when we get to that point, we're like, okay, now do you need to have them repleted? Is it out of balance because you don't have enough or because I do think we're throwing hormones on some women that don't necessarily even need it just to say that they're back in balance. No. For instance, estrogen, progesterone, there's a lot of things that are driving estrogen dominance right now. One of which is the plastic, the endocrine disruptors we talked about earlier, right? The imbalance in the gut bacteria, not breaking down their own natural estrogens. We take care of that. We won't need a supplement with progesterone because they'll be back in balance. So that's how I came to doing what I'm doing. I had a little little reservations, even though I knew this was my calling. Like I said earlier, like I, everything's this download, like this hit. I don't want to get too woo-woo, but I get these, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do next. A year ago, it was libido. And I was like, this like my head would get into it, like my little ego. Oh, don't do that. It's hard. Like it's complex. Like it's constantly changing and everyone's different. And then I was like, no, this is what I need to do because this is the message just not getting out there. And I have to say, since I've been talking about it, women are coming out of the woodwork thinking that it was normal. It's normal at a particular stage of their life. After having kids, perimenopause, menopause, you name it, they thought it was normal and that they're going to have to live with it. And the, the comments I'm getting on some of my social media posts and messages I'm getting are just like, oh my gosh, it's a big problem. And it's it shouldn't be tab. tab. We, we, I don't necessarily go right into the bedroom and talk about what happens there. We got it for women. We have to start way before then. We have to start. It starts in our head. Men is different. It starts somewhere else in their body, but ours it starts in our head. And we really have to uh, respect that and address that to want to get her to want to go into that bedroom because right now she doesn't even want to go in there. So I don't even address what goes on in the bedroom. There's a rare case where that's where the focus, that's where the problem lies. But again, that's a rare case. Most of the time they just don't even want to go there. So I work on why, what is it that's underlying that they don't want to get in there? And what do you find is the most common reason for low libido in women? Is it stress? Is it hormonal imbalance? Is What are contributing? Uh, mindset. I know. I bet you didn't think I was going to say that one. It's interesting because I've really had to dilute this down. I do a lot. I have my a little whiteboard in front of me and I have a bunch of things written on it. And I sit here and I just look at it. And when I when we talk about hormone imbalance, come all the way back, right? mindset. If she doesn't feel, if she doesn't feel she's enough or worthy, she doesn't think she's ever going to lose weight. She thinks that she's not beautiful enough, skinny enough. All those things we tell ourselves, we lead ourselves down this like self-sabotaging behaviors of eating foods that we don't necessarily want to eat, but we're eating them because we're like, oh, you know what? I can't lose the weight anyhow. Look at me. I'm so disgusting. I'm just going to eat this. And I just spoke about earlier, that is disrupting our gut bacteria, which is in causing a hormonal imbalance. So can we go to hormones? Yes. But if we keep coming back, stress, same thing, can cause hormone balance. But the stress, we start with the mindset. Why aren't you asking? Why aren't you feeling worthy to ask for help? Like, why do you feel like you have to do it all? Was that something you were taught? Is this something ingrained from childhood? I've done a lot of work myself and it's a lot easier for us to just put the pill on it or put the cream or, but when we go in to figure out like why we do what we do, what feelings are we in? What feelings are we having? What thoughts are we having with those feelings? And can we address those versus running to the food that will s- cause a hormonal balance down down the, the road? Like women don't want to hear that I say, take responsibility, stop looking for the outside solution or the outside blame, come within and say, where can I start now? And that's usually with her mindset. And I know it's like not exactly what anyone ever expects me to say, but When I have to go downstream of what could be the problem, when I work my way upstream, 
it can all, it all stems from that. I, I don't think I've had correspondence with one woman in either I work with or in messages or wherever that doesn't have an underlying mindset component to her. So I have an extremely, extraordinarily high libido. So Yay! I had no idea <laughs> that this was so common. So I started asking my friends before I had you on. And they're like, yeah, it's like hard sometimes. I'm tired. I'm stressed. I just don't want to. I'm not in the mood. I'm just like, what? Mm -hmm. If you're stressed, that's what you do <laughs> in my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a wonderful stress. That's the other myth out there that it's for just procreating. And when you're done with that, you don't need it anymore. And there's so many positive benefits. It's it's the number one stress reducer, in my opinion. It helps with confidence, self-esteem, boost productivity, creativity, like hormone balance, like all of the good things that we want in our bodies, we can get just by being intimate. But once again, I can say all that, but if the woman doesn't even want it, <laughs> despite her wanting all those benefits, let's go back and figure out, for instance, with the stress. And Generally, it's like the th top three that I see with all my clients, mindset, communication. I used to say relationship, but now it's communication in and out of the bedroom because I've had some new knowledge because I never knew, this is my, this is how naive sometimes I am, that of course a woman's not going to want to go into the bedroom if she's not getting pleasured. I had a conversation with one woman that said, yeah, about 20% of the time I get pleasured. I'm like, so you're telling me 80% of the time you're going in there and you're no pleasure. She's yeah. I'm like, of course you don't want to go in there. What? And I have, so, so she changed that. She communicated what she needed. He was so excited. He was like, you first, like before me, like he made it like this fun, not game, but it became fun in the bedroom then. And of course she's like messaging me. She's like, okay, we're twice a day now. This is great. We're back to both of us getting for women and orgasm. It's that's where all the benefits come from. Sometimes the connection, the oxytocin is great, but like the benefit of an orgasm is just amazing. And a woman going in there with the intention of getting some sort of pleasure, then coming out without it is not ideal. Can it happen once in a while? Fine, fine, once in a while. But I want I don't want it to happen at all. And I've had women like want to, there's this whole other long relationships and things get boring and I'm afraid to introduce toys. And we have to, again, if you want to explore different things in the bedroom, including toys, I think you should feel comfortable enough with your partner and not feel like it's a blow to their ego to say, hey, let's have fun. But let him play with it. With like you guys can just be creative. And so my communication got my, that little part of my I call them my roadmap or my roadblocks. Like that got expanded from the communication outside the bedroom, which is what I normally talk about on shows of what you need. But that also pertains to in the bedroom. What do you need in the bedroom? They're not mind readers, by the way. They don't know. It. Like outside the bedroom, if you look like you have it all under control, they're going to be like, okay, you look good. I'm just going to... I'm just going to stand back while you got everything under control. Meanwhile, you're exhausted. You're overwhelmed. You're resentful. Just ask for help. But in the bedroom, if you're not asking that you want to be pleasured or like some sort of indication without feeling that you're not worthy or he's not going to know. I'm hopeful he'll know, but not all men know. Like I, I know what my husband's, but I can't speak for all husbands. So I think you just have to be clear as far as what you need in and out of the bedroom. And then the third is always stress. There's again, there's a huge surge in stress right now. I love that you use it as a stress reliever. Hey, let's start our day. Like being a little more de-stressed. Sex and, or, and uh, meditation would be wonderful. You can do them actually together. But anyhow, it's those are the, probably the three underlying. And again, a lot of them can lead to hormone imbalances and mood issues. And we can get into nutrition. But w when I have the heavy hitters in the beginning, it's just the three of those are always, I would say 100% of the time at the root cause. And then plus or minus some of the other things like the nutrition, underlying inflammation, toxins. So we could always add that and just, just icing on the cake, but we got to get to the foundation of, I always say, if I don't work on the foundation is the mindset. If I don't work on that, the whole building's going to crumble. Like I can get you to lose the weight to feel more confident. And if that's an issue, but at the end of the day, if you gain the weight because you didn't feel good about yourself, that's just, a, it's just, again, a band aid. Let's get to working on, because we're a work in progress in my opinion. I work on my mindset, my mind, I journal, I do it every day. Like I, it takes time. Yes. But like at the end of the day, I'm a much, much more introspective as far as how I feel, how I think when I reflect on it versus just going about my day in a rush and doing the same thoughts, feelings that always, I always do that are not serving me. Like when I start working on reversing all those thoughts I've had for the past 40 plus years, 
it's helpful and it'll get me in a different place, mind, body, and spirit. I was just thinking about how you said that a lot of women don't orgasm when they have sex. And that reminded me of a bunch of my friends who said that they were having that problem. So they didn't want to have sex with their, their husbands. Mm -hmm. And that was just so shocking to me that someone would have sex and not orgasm and be okay with that. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think of what I must do differently. So then I remember telling this one friend, okay, pretend you're the hottest girl in the world. And the hottest girl in the world is going to demand a lot from their partner because they're very lucky to be with her. Mm -hmm. So what is she going to say if he does not give her an orgasm? She's not going to sit there and go, okay, maybe next time. <laughs> no, she's going to say, no, you need to step up because – you're with the hottest girl in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. Most men want to. Most men feel like it's a failure walking out of the bedroom without I and I say most men, I guess I've just had a skewed population of men in my life, but they feel like it's a failure if they don't if you don't have an orgasm, at least before or by the time he's done. The other thing I have to say is not every woman will orgasm with vaginal penetration. Many women need clitoral stimulation, whether that be from him, from you, Gosh, they love when you do it yourself. Like they love watching you, but get a get a vibrator, get a toy. Like let's take the shame out of using toys and our masturbating and it's just it's interesting. I grew up in a Catholic house. We didn't talk about these things and I don't know why it's so like self-pleasure or pleasure with a partner is so taboo because it's healthy. It's healthy. At the end of the day it's healthy. And again, I think a lot of women too they're in their head about taking so long, get out of your head, get into the moment. I think a lot of women too, were so living in the past, living in the future, just be present. And that includes during sex, be present with him, with the, the sensation, with how you're feeling, without the pressure of having to come in a minute. There's no time going off here. He's enjoying himself. You're enjoying yourself. Just have fun with it. Yeah, it might be a little personal, but I had an ex-boyfriend that his girlfriend told me that she does not get any pleasure when they have sex. And I'm just like, no, honey, he can do that. You just need to make him step because he did it just fine before. So sometimes it's the women coming into it with the bad self-esteem mm -hmm. and just not asking and not saying anything because it's not the guys. And I think we always blame the guys. Yeah. And it's not always fair because sometimes they just need to to be told what to do. Yep. Yep. I agree. And that's the communication, right? And that's your mindset of feeling how you feel and what you feel like you deserve in the bedroom. The other thing I just want to add, it, it could be a position thing. Like positions are definitely different sensations and maybe you just have to play with a position to make it or a place in the house, the shower, downstairs in the kitchen. I don't know. Have fun with it. And I think sometimes the, I don't know, for some people, the, I don't know the, I don't want to say the naughtier it is, but the more, the more mundane it is too. the, okay, let's just go do it in the bedroom on the bed in this one position. It's have fun with it, change it up different place, get some lingerie. If you like lingerie, go get a new piece of lingerie from Victoria's Secret or online, just something or send your, be careful with pictures, but like, send pictures, send messages, just get excitement started. If you're feeling like tonight's the night. It's so funny. There's sometimes I would be doing that. And my husband says, are you ovulating? Because <laughs> we have twins. So he's always, he was always so nervous because of course, women's testosterone goes up. If you're not on any hormonal contraception, you, it goes up mid cycle. And it's nature's way of us wanting to be intimate because there's a time of the month that we're most fertile and that's it. And so it was just a funny little story that he used to say to me. And I was like, no. I actually have to stop and look. I don't know. No, it's just don't ask why. But yeah, so I think there's a lot when it comes to the bedroom too and a lot of things you can do. But it comes back that, to that mindset component of like, you have to feel like you're worthy, that you are worthy. You're not, I don't have to tell you, you are worthy of being pleasured. You are enough as you are. And you just have to communicate and tell him what you need. Because we can say at the other end, we don't want him to feel bad with you leaving without an orgasm. So let's make him feel good and do what it takes for you to orgasm, whether that be, again, clitoral stimulation, toys, just taking more time, different positions, whatever. Do it and get pleasured. So then you want to go back in there again the next day when you're feeling a little stressed. Come on, honey, let's go. Let's start our day off or end the day right or middle of the day, whatever you want. So tell us how can everyone work with you and tell us about your masterclass. Yes. I take a few one-on-ones. I'm actually developing currently as we speak a group program because I have so many women in need and there's only one of me. So I can't work one-on-one -on -one with all, 
I feel like all the women that need my help right now. And I've really, that's why I do a lot of sitting back, looking at my whiteboard, thinking like and studying even more of what women are commonly going through so I can help more women together because women do crave support and community, especially going through something like this, right? Like they, I think women in community and different ideas and different support is great. So I do work with women one-on-one. I am in the process to be stay tuned because it's coming out very soon with a group program. And you can find that at drreneewellenstein.com and I'm all over social media. So come again, those are all my platforms to give free information or at least recommendations, especially when it comes to libido. Um, I'm a big on TikTok. And what was the other question? <laughs> I feel like I got off on a tangent thinking of, I was daydreaming about my program, my upcoming program. Who is your ideal audience for your masterclass? Oh, my masterclass. Yes. I have three strategies to implement today to overcome burnout. Gosh, any woman who thinks she's dealing with burnout, any woman. I think the biggest thing when it comes to that masterclass is I wanted to give women the like the foundational, number one validation that a lot of the symptoms she's feeling are, are indeed burnout. And so I talk about that in the masterclass, but some foundational, just like I talk with mindset with libido, foundational things that she can implement right away and start working on to start taking control of her burnout. And then I give a little bonus as far as we talked about earlier that I can tell you all the lifestyle changes in the world, but if I don't give you a little extra supplementation recommendations as far as help, you're really not going to take action because you're not going to have the energy or the feeling that you're calm enough to do it. So I give those in the masterclass as well. Of course, I always say check with your doctor first. I'm not your doctor, but yeah, it's sign up on my, it's free. Come on over to my website, sign up. And I do also have a burnout masterclass as well. So because at the end of the day, this is something I talk about a lot. And I see when, even if a woman doesn't have libido issues, a lot of them have burnout. So I did create a six week course for that. And I poured all that I know regarding the treatment of burnout into this six week course. That's like a DIY. So I have that as well. So there's a lot of ways out there right now that I, I help women either for free or a course and, and more ways coming. So really excited about that. And is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with before we go? I feel like I just, I want everyone to know that they, it is their birthright to feel amazing. I think so many women don't, they think they feel okay, but when they really get present in their bodies, they're like, yeah, no, maybe I don't feel good. Whether it be libido or energy levels or self-esteem mindset. And you, we have, we get one life and it's short enough. And I don't want any of your listeners to live a life thinking they're less than or not enough, or they should have done X, Y, and Z. You can do it and you can feel amazing. It does take a little effort, but anyone can do all of the things that we're talking about today. Just one foot in front of the other baby steps and feeling amazing can be yours as well. Thank you so much for your time. And I will put everything in the show notes so everyone can go and check you out. Sounds good. Thank you.